Okay, I think we're ready to go. And so welcome to the last um, transportation seminar for winter 2003. Um, quick little announcement for those students taking the course for credit. The uh, journal or paper will be due next Friday by 5 p.m. to Jennifer. Uh, if, there, if there are any questions about that, you can see us afterwards. Um, the course is available next term, uh, as it was supposed to be this term, as a civil engineering course and a USP course. Um, so please sign up. And I, I'm very happy to introduce Professor Chris Higgins from Oregon State University, who's here to talk to us today about uh, an exciting research program down at OSU related to the um, statewide bridge problem. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks a lot for coming. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, nice to be here this afternoon to talk about uh, a pretty large research project that we're working on uh, a couple hours south of here on uh, some of these sheer crack 1950s vintage uh, reinforced concrete deck bridges, and I'll explain uh, specifically the, the type of bridge that we're working on. Uh, start, I'd like to start by giving you an overview of um, what I'll be talking about this afternoon, uh, give you some background about the project, uh, the, the scope. Uh, that we're working on. It includes some uh, field studies, uh, instrumentation of bridges in service, uh, uh, combined with some laboratory experiments that we're working on, uh, some future work that we're looking toward, and some of the initial findings that we uh, have. As far as background goes, probably most of you, if you read the papers, uh, the Oregonian in particular, um, should have heard about this problem. Uh, and it uh, is narrowly focused roughly on uh, uh, a family of bridges that were built around the 1950s. Uh, and we have a large number of these uh, age bridges in ODOT's inventory as a result of uh, bonding uh, uh, that was being done in the early 50s as well as the interstate boom. Um, and so of these large uh, numbers of bridges, we have about uh, 1,500 of what we call deck girder bridges. And of these 1,500, roughly one-third, or a little over 500 of these, uh, are showing some type of shear cracking at different uh, levels of um, uh, damage. So there's, uh, these bridges are located at essentially every uh, major transportation corridor in the state. And it looks to be uh, pretty specifically an Oregon problem. When you look up at the uh, state of Washington, you look down south at the state of California, you just don't see, uh, the, first of all, numbers of bridges or uh, the numbers of bridges with damage. Um, so it, it looks to be pretty much focused here in Oregon. Uh, and it's resulted in a couple uh, issues on both of our major interstates, I-84 and I-5. Uh, I-84 has been posted uh, for loads exceeding 20,000 uh, pounds for single axle and 34,000 pounds on tandems, and gross vehicle weight of about 105 kips. Now, it's really only a small fraction of the trucks, but that's, uh, those are the, the big trucks. Um, and it, the cost, as far as economic dollars required to route those trucks around these damaged bridges is becoming significant. Uh, I-5 has recently been posted, and that's created quite a bit of um, interest in this problem. Uh, two bridges, one over uh, the McKinsey River and one over the Willamette River, which is forcing bridges to detour off of I-85 and cross something like 54 other bridges in order to skirt these three damaged bridges. And the time required and the distance required uh, is uh, pretty significant. So it's going to start showing up in terms of costs of goods in the state. Uh, we've also, uh, ODOT's been uh, forced to do some emergency repairs on I-5 uh, on a, a bridge by the name of Booth Ranch Bridge uh, over uh, one of the Umpqua Rivers um, because they were uh, concerned that uh, they couldn't wait uh, to uh, act. And the costs, uh, the, the dollar figures that people are talking about for this is certainly over $1 billion, perhaps closer to $2 billion, um, and the exact number really is not known to replace or repair these, these uh, damaged bridges. All right, so uh, reinforced deck girder bridges is this kind of family of bridges that we're talking about. And what I mean by that is if you look at this uh, upper picture, you can see that uh, you've got the main uh, girders here and the deck underneath here, and the deck and girders are integral with, it, with one another. And so uh, we call this uh, deck girder bridge. And the kind of damage that we're seeing, uh, here's an example of a shear crack located in, obviously, a high shear region uh, adjacent to the supports. Uh, and a, a, some kind of an angle to this crack that indicates diagonal tension uh, associated with shear. 
Uh, this kind of gives you a, a histogram of the numbers of uh, reinforced concrete bridges that were built in the period of 1947 to 1962. Uh, the blue uh, bars here are the total numbers of bridges that were built in each year. And you can see that as you get to about 1975, we stopped building these kinds of bridges. And one of the reasons we switched to pre-stressed concrete instead of conventionally reinforced concrete. So, but during this era, about 1947 uh, to about uh, mid-60s or so, there, you can see that there's quite a large number of these structures being built. And the red lines show you that the, uh, the number of the population that are actually showing damage. So like I said earlier, about a third of these bridges are showing some type of shear cracking. Uh, here's some other uh, examples of some uh, shear cracks. Uh, this uh, little gauge right here is a visual indicator that um, inspectors can go back and check if that crack is opening or, or closing um, under, uh, if they go back, a, let's say, a year uh, later or even a few weeks later to monitor these cracks. Uh, this crack uh, on the left-hand side is 0.06. That's not an insignificant shear crack. Uh, here's another type of shear, uh, example of a shear crack on the Applegate River Bridge. Uh, about the biggest crack that they've seen for, in terms of size, crack width, is about a tenth of an inch. And the reason this crack size is important is because we're relying on uh, a number of different mechanisms to transmit shear across these cracks. And you've got the embedded reinforcing stirrups that are carrying uh, force, and you've also got aggregate interlock, or the interaction of these two crack surfaces on, let's say, the left and right side of the crack. And if the crack is fairly narrow, we can transmit shear across that crack. As the crack becomes wider and wider, the concrete contribution at that interface begins to diminish, and as a result, the capacity is going to uh, decrease. And so the crack width um, is a pretty uh, important uh, parameter as far as indicating how much uh, capacity uh, is remaining in these things. And one of the concerns is, are these cracks growing over time? We've got these bridges open to traffic, uh, num large numbers of trucks and heavy trucks crossing these bridges. And is there a concern that over time these cracks grow wider, uh, the capacity continues to diminish, uh, and potentially even fatiguing the embedded reinforcing steel? So where are these bridges? Well, uh, they're, like I said earlier, they're all over the state, and they're essentially on every major transportation co corridor. And if you look at this map, uh, first of all, you can make out a uh, pretty nice string of uh, these bridges running north-south. That happens to be I-5. Uh, and up here we've got I-84. There's a number of um, cracked bridges. Now, the, the dots here are just, uh, I think, the intermediate damage bridges. So ODOT is classifying these accor uh, according to stage, stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3. And stage 1 is uh, showing a few cracks scattered uh, all the way up to stage 3, which is many widely spaced cracks. So this is just looking at stage two bridges. So if I overlap stage one, stage two, and stage three, um, we'd have an uh, even uh, larger uh, dotted map. So some of the things that ODOT has uh, done to uh, try to uh, uh, remediate this problem, uh, if not temporarily, uh, one of the things is to epoxy inject some of these cracks. And so what they do is they uh, seal off the cracks and inject epoxy into them. Uh, under pressure, uh, that epoxy hardens and it, uh, the intent is to freeze the, the shear crack. Uh, this is uh, John, on the left is the John Day River uh, Bridge. Um, this one, uh, it, 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 ODOT was monitoring it and watched the cracks grow fairly significantly in a short period of time and had to react quickly um, to try to prevent that from uh, becoming a worse situation. Uh, some other uh, types of repairs, uh, one of them uh, shown here on the left is uh, external stirrups, and what you can see is uh, drilled through the deck, passed through uh, some type of high-strength threaded rod, uh, channel section underneath here, and essentially put on suspenders to hold uh, the two sides of a crack uh, together. Uh, another type of uh, way to increase the shear capacity would be to external post tension. Um, so we've got some large ducts going through a deviator here, and as you uh, pull those post-tensioning uh, strands, you compress the cracks, and if you can essentially close those cracks and increase the shear capacity. Uh, another type of repair is using uh, fiber-reinforced polymers, uh, carbon fiber. Essentially, you're bonding on strips of carbon fiber on the outside to provide supplemental shear reinforcement. And here's the worst case. This is uh, the South Umpqua River uh, Fords Bridge. This is I-5. 
required emergency repairs. Essentially what they did is they built a bridge underneath the bridge, and you can see the steel girders going in here. Additional steel uh, located at the bench to support this bridge underneath the, the bridge. Uh, that's expensive to do. All right, so why do we have this particular problem? And, well, one of the reasons we're doing this research is to try to understand why. Um, but one of the uh, reasons that's apparent is if we compare the specification from 1950s to the specification that we would use today uh, as to in terms of the standard spec, um, not the LRFD <coughs> specification, but uh, 16th edition standard spec uh, from 1996 would allow us to use uh, for the sh allowable concrete stress in shear would be um, 0.95 times the square root of F prime C. Well, back in 1953, what they would have allowed is 0 0.03 times the uh, uh, square root of, uh, not square root, but just times F prime C. And so for different concrete strengths here, 3,000 up to about 5,000, you can see that we would rely less on the concrete to carry shear than they would have in the 1950s. So as a result, if you're counting on the concrete to do more for you, you would put in fewer stirrups. And so as a result, um, these 1950s vintage uh, bridges uh, tend to be lightly reinforced for shear. It's interesting uh, to note, if you look at the, the load side of the equation, the, what the design truck looks like, it's the equivalent truck, same, HS20 um, uh, uh, type design truck. The magnitude hasn't changed, the axle spacings are, are the same. Uh, another thing that's uh, interesting is the, the shear provisions, how you would design the stirrups is equivalent from 1950 to what we would do today. So really the, the biggest difference in the specification comes from the concrete uh, contribution. Um, I should also let you know that in the 50s, that during this uh, kind of construction for these uh, deck girder bridges, the design strength was about 3,300 PSI. All right, so we uh, started looking at this project when it became apparent that um, there were larger and larger numbers of these shear cracked bridges um, back in the fall of 2001. And we started by looking, doing some field evaluation, going out and instrumenting uh, bridges uh, to look at what kind of stresses are being produced in them uh, under ambient traffic loading and then also under some controlled truck loading. Uh, doing some analysis, both just simplified hand type of calculations as well as some detailed uh, finite element analysis, uh, looking at distribution of loads, uh, and correlation of our field test data with some analysis. Also doing some strength test la uh, laboratory specimens and looking at fatigue, how these cracks change as we load these many, many times, um, and finally developing some assessment methods so that someone can go out in the field, look at a, a, a particular configuration, particular crack size, and try to estimate what's the remaining life how long can this uh, particular crack sustain the, the loads that it's seeing, as well as what kind of overload capacity it has. Uh, well, one of the bridges that we looked at is the uh, Oregon 218 crossing the Willamette River just south of Newburgh. Uh, the bridge was designed in 1956 and constructed about 1959. The design load is the H20 S1644, equivalent to uh, H, uh, H20 today, H, HS20 today. Um, it's uh, actually got three spans, uh, but not three span continuous. So we've got a simple span and then a two span continuous segment that make up these three spans. Uh, the beams are re rectangular and prismatic, so we don't have any haunches, we don't have any tapers, but it's not uncommon to find haunch sections, meaning the depth gets larger as you get into the supports, as well as tapering the section. The, the, the section could get wider as you get into the supports. Um, some cores were taken from this particular bridge. Remember I told you the design strength was 3,300 PSI. The actual average compression strength was 4,500 PSI, but a standard deviation of about 1,000. So that's a pretty wide scatter uh, as far as compression strength goes. So at the low end, you would see one standard deviation away, you would see uh, 3,500. So not much above the design uh, strength. Uh, here's an image uh, of that three-span structure. And again, uh, the simple span is over here on the far left side. And here are your two-span continuous. So th this is a pin support here. It's a pin support here. And the, the bridge is continuous over this uh, bent. Uh, so the first thing we did is go out and inspect the spans. Um, and we marked a grid on the uh, face of the girder so we could reference where the reinforcing stirrups were as well as where these shear cracks were located. Um, and we recorded the size of the crack uh, as far as the width goes and the location and the orientation relative to that grid. 
And we had to pick some kind of a threshold size. We, obviously, uh, concrete, it's been described as cracks held together by steel. And you have cracks of all different kinds of sizes, ranging from large to small. And so we had to pick a threshold that, you know, be below with we wouldn't consider. And we picked that to be 0.3 millimeter, which is a hairline crack. And it would be, uh, I mean, you really have to go out with uh, uh, fine detail to, to pick out cracks uh, that were smaller than that. Uh, we located the reinforcing steel with a profometer. It's a non-destructive uh, device that allows you, through using eddy currents, uh, to detect the location of the reinforcing steel. And what we did also is we identified locations where we wanted to instrument, where we would chip into the concrete and install strain gauges to measure the stresses that were being produced in the bridge. Uh, so we're in Oregon, so we work in the rain. Uh, we uh, try to pick bridges that we have access to from underneath so we don't have to control uh, traffic and have flaggers um, uh, on top of the bridge and just using a personnel lift to get access to the spans. I'm in the car drinking coffee. <laughs> Those are my graduate students up in the bucket. Uh, here's a, a little closer up view of, uh, of what we would consider a fairly wide shear crack. This is one point, about 1.25 millimeter wide crack, fairly large. Uh, and the red line here is our uh, grid, our chalk line um, that we snapped. We've since gone to laser measuring, so we don't have to apply this reference grid anymore, but we can measure everything using lasers uh, much faster and with uh, a, a high degree of precision now, and it, it uh, speeds up the process. Um, it, what I'm showing here is, again, a typical crack uh, oriented at some uh, angle, which tells us it's shear. We're in a high shear region near the support. And you can see it, it's a, it, the angle is not exactly 44 degrees or 45 degrees. It changes. In fact, you can see it's vertically oriented down here. It turns or, uh, roughly 45 degrees here and turns vertical here and then turns diagonal once again. And it reaches up here where you see this arrow, the soffit of the deck and the stem. And what happens is that shear crack doesn't continue to propagate up at an angle, but it turns horizontal and it propagates along the deck and web interface. Now, what are these blue lines? Well, these blue lines are we've superimposed in the embedded reinforcing steel. So if you just looked at this crack without knowing where the reinforcing steel is, you'd say, what a strange looking crack. It's vertical, it's diagonal, it's vertical, it's diagonal. Well, if you know where the reinforcing steel is, you know why it's vertical. Because the crack is looking for the path of least resistance. And so it wants to propagate it at uh, some diagonal. And then you can see that here it encounters reinforcing steel. There's some resistance to it to continue to propagate on that angle. So it's got to go, try to go up and around. And so it turns vertical. Eventually it can't and it turns diagonal again. So the, if you know the presence of the steel, it kind of makes sense why the cracks are the orientations that they are. Uh, one thing that's uh, interesting is you can really tell that the reinforcing steel is working hard for you, um, meaning it's there to, to keep those cracks as small as possible. So you can see you can they get a fairly wide shear crack coming in, and as it comes to a reinforcing bar, this is the blue mark here, you can see that it tapers out. The crack width becomes small, and you, it feathers, so you've got a, uh, it kind of branches into smaller cracks. And so you can see that that embedded stirrup is really working hard to keep that crack uh, as small as it can. Uh, but the, one of the things we're working against is we have wi fairly widely spaced uh, stirrups, again, because of that, uh, what you would count on for the concrete strength back in the 50s. All right, so here's kind of a composite of our grid, which is shown with all the uh, yellow lines here, superimposed with these dashed uh, green lines, and it might be hard to see on the web, but um, those are the embedded stirrups. And the white lines here, are the cracks that we measured. And you can see that there's some vertical cracks, and those uh, would be primarily associated with shrinkage. And you can see, I'm looking at, oops, I think I might have gone. Uh, this is the exterior span, so I failed to mention, but there are four girder lines for this particular bridge. So there's an exterior girder, interior girder, interior girder, exterior girder. And there's two lanes of traffic, one heading northbound, one heading southbound. So you essentially have two girder lines that are supporting each lane of traffic. One exterior girder line, one interior girder line. And this span that I'm looking at from bent five on the left-hand side, if it will give me my cursor back, here we go, bent five, this is the mid-span location, and this is the same mid-span location. So you kind of have to sew these two things together. And then we get back to bent four. So this is the simple support, bent four is the continuous support, and then it's somewhat mirrored on the other side. So what you look at at the simple support, this is the two-span continuous portion, not much shear cracking, 
But as you get to the continuous support, you get uh, a good number of shear cracks, and these are not small, 1.25 millimeter shear cracks. And part of that is due to the statics of the problem. The indeterminacy creates higher shear from dead load and live load at the interior support location. So we're seeing larger cracking over adjacent to the continuous supports rather than the simple supports. And so if I compare, this is the exterior girder. If I look now at the interior girder, same position on the bridge, you can see that, first of all, there's uh, not as many cracks, but again, not too much at the simple support, more cracks, shear cracks, some angle uh, at the continuous support, but not nearly as many. So if I'll flip back and forth between the interior and exterior and just take a look here at the continuous uh, uh, bent or th where the span is continuous over bent four. So you can see kind of I'll flip back and forth and you can see that there's quite a bit of difference in the shear cracking on the exterior side versus the interior side. And that really depends on where the wheel positions are uh, relative to the girder locations. And it turns out on this bridge that the exterior girder is about right over where the uh, wheel lines would line up for, uh, uh, for trucks. So we're producing additional uh, cracking on the exterior um, uh, beams or girders. All right, so the next thing we did is we went in and uh, selected some locations to instrument and strain gauge the embedded reinforcing steel and measured wh whether these cracks are working, whether they're opening and closing under load. And we used fairly high acquisition rates so we could measure dynamic response. Um, and we left the bridge, the instrumentation, for uh, uh, open for about seven days so we could collect a week of data, get a pretty good picture of uh, what the stress ranges uh, the, this bridge is seeing. Uh, we picked a minimum threshold of about 0.3 KSI. Uh, it, you can imagine if we're counting stress cycles, you don't expect many large ones, but you got because those are produced by trucks, and there aren't as many trucks on the road relative to cars. So cars are producing small stress ranges, trucks are producing larger stress ranges. And bicycles are producing really small stress ranges, pedestrians even smaller, and butterflies minuscule. Right? And so we picked this minimum threshold, about 0.3 KSI, so we don't measure things like uh, even passenger cars would produce a little bit higher than that. But less than that, we're not really uh, going to pick those up. And finally, we did some controlled uh, truck tests with an uh, ODOT maintenance vehicle. Uh, so here's kind of an overall picture. Again, you can see the red grid lines. That's our reference point. And you can see that there's uh, some attachment here uh, on the exterior face. And you zoom in on this, and you can see that I've got a sensor here that's going across the crack. So it's bonded here and it's bonded here. So on both sides of the crack. And this is a little tra displacement transducer that's measuring the crack motion. So displacement of the crack um, a perpendicular to the uh, crack direction. And you can see we've chipped into the reinforcing steel. And uh, I've got a little closer view on the next slide that shows right in between the diamond deformation patterns is a little strain gauge so that we can measure the stress in that in rebar right at the crack location. There's our data acquisition system bolted up on the top of a abutment. And here's kind of a typical trace, time history response, in terms of strain on the left-hand side, which we can convert to stress because the strains are in the elastic range, so we can multiply by Young's modulus to produce stresses. And uh, this is at a particular location. You can see that this is produced by a truck. Uh, I can tell that from looking at the first one is the drive axle coming over. And as it passes, it drops off. But then it increases again as it gets to the, the uh, axles that are actually carrying the, the weight of the, uh, whatever's inside the truck. And then it actually goes negative because this is a continuous bridge. So as the truck rolls to the other side, the bridge haunches up. Uh, and we're producing a stress range, actually, on the compression side. And so you have to remember, this crack is open, so it can go in tension if the crack is uh, spreading, getting wider, and the crack can close a little bit as the truck moves across on the other side of the bend. And this particular stress range from peak to peak, 280 microstrain to minus 80 microstrain, produces a stress range of about 10.4 KSI. And that was, a, that was the largest stress range that we actually measured in the bridge. All right, so what kind of um, numbers of cycles and at different stress ranges are we seeing? And I, if you remember, I said cars produce a large number of stress ranges, but at small uh, stress levels. Um, and trucks produce larger stress ranges, but not as many numbers of cycles. So if we look here at stress ranges uh, from 10 KSI back down to zero, you can see that there aren't many large stress cycles. But as you get to small stress cycles, you can see that there are a large number of them. 
And this is kind of a typical, uh, I guess, rain flow uh, assessment of the numbers of cycles that one would see for a bridge. A lot of pedestrian, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, typical uh, cars, SUVs, uh, and uh, the population drops down as you get to larger, heavier trucks. So what we did for these eight locations is we converted the variable amplitude uh, fatigue. So we had lot cycles of all different stress ranges. And using something called miner's rule, we produce an equivalent constant amplitude stress range. So if I had to take all these variable amplitude stresses and apply them to this bridge or element at one particular stress range, what would it be? Well, miner's rule tells us that for all of these eight locations, that the three worst ones, location five, six, and seven here, we would apply an equivalent stress range of about 1.6 KSI. That's pretty small, actually. All right, so what does this mean? Well, when, if you look at the p potential issue with fatigue, which means that the embedded reinforcing steel that's crossing these cracks is being loaded in tension and loaded a little bit in compression uh, because of the indeterminacy of the problem, is there a potential to generate a fatigue crack of that stirrup that's working hard for us to keep those, those cracks uh, con confined? Um, is, is there possible that we could propagate a crack and have one of those rebar fracture? And so we look back at the uh, rebar fatigue data, and what we see is that if we can keep the stress range at below 20 KSI on the straight leg of a stirrup or, or any reinforcing bar, that you would expect to have a, a long life, infinite life. So if we, the stress range is below 20 KSI, straight bar, infinite life. If we can keep the stress range below 10 KSI at a bend location, for example, we have stirrups that have to bend 90 degrees to get at the soffit of the, of the web and then bend 90 degrees to go back up the other side, we would expect if you can keep that less than 10 KSI, you're going to have a long life as well. And so we look back at our data for this week of time, and you can see that there were only three locations, five, six, and seven. Those are the ones that had the largest um, stress cycles. We only measured six cycles above 10 KSI. So if we project that out 50 years, 100 years, when one would expect that you would never accumulate enough cycles to have the a stirrup uh, fatigue. So that's a good thing. But we've got a little caveat. By the time we got to this bridge, it was load posted at 80,000 pounds. So we don't know what it would have been under open conditions, right? So one assumes that uh, the truckers are obeying the law to skirt around this bridge. Um, and we didn't see that there were that many large cycles. So uh, it might be skewed uh, in the low range because of the load posting. And so as a result, we're looking at a number of other bridges, I-5 uh, in particular, uh, to look at what kind of heavy loads uh, uh, and stress ranges are being produced. All right, another thing we're doing is at each one of the, uh, at select locations, what we've done is we've triggered a video camera to turn on when the stress threshold is reached. So what kind of trucks are producing these large stresses? And so um, what happens is when a large um, truck goes over, produces a large stress range, and we, it, it turns on our camera, and we can record what does this truck look like. And you can see I'll play it a couple times for you. Uh, this is I-5 over uh, the McKinsey River. And it turns out that we're producing, and it looks like Microsoft wants me to do more stuff here. Um, we're, it happens that there are two tractor trailers right next to one another. That The combined effect of both of these in the northbound lanes um, produces a large stress range. So I'll play that again. And you can see that first you see there's a, the red truck is a regular uh, tractor trailer, and then there's a truck carrying pipes that's on the inside lane. So it's a combined effect of both of those trucks that's producing a large stress range. All right, so we've also done some control load tests, meaning we've taken a, a vehicle where we know the axle spacings, we know the axle weights because we've sent it off to a weight scale to be measured, and we can position that truck in the lanes at different locations and different speeds to look at what's the effect of the dynamic rate. So the truck driving slowly across the bridge produces a different effect than a truck driving across at 50, uh, 55 or higher uh, miles per hour. And we compare that with uh, some of uh, our analytical results. So here's our ODOT maintenance truck loaded up. Uh, we've got a rear tandem, about 30, uh, 36,000 pounds. And the front drive axle here at 15.5 uh, uh, kips. 
And this is a plan view of the bridge. Uh, again, this is the simply supported span over here, and this is the two span continuous, and here's that continuous support. And what we do is in the northbound lanes, we drive the truck in the lane, and we also drive the truck in the fog line. So essentially have the truck driving right on that white stripe on the right-hand side. And then we also drive the truck going back in the southbound lanes. And so we can look at the effect of the southbound contribution to the stresses on the northbound girders. And we can also look at the northbound traffic and its effect on the northbound girders as well. All right, so here is a, a trace of microstrain. Think of that as stress um, as, a, as a function of time at a particular location. And you can see that if I drive slowly, if I creep this truck across at about five miles an hour, I produce this red line. And you can see that, first of all, uh, you can see the truck approach because the bridge actually go or the, the stress actually decreases. And as it comes across, there's the front drive axle. It decreases because it's now moving away. And then it climbs back up as I get to that rear tandem that has all the weight on it. And finally, that drops back off. So a nice slow loading rate. If I do that same truck, and I plot this in the same time, you can see at 59 miles an hour, uh, which is about as fast as we could get this truck going because of the grade. <laughs> uh, whoops. Um, it, we could get a larger stress, right? And this peak here is about 46% higher than the peak. It's the same truck. It's just the fact that driving it across at a, a higher rate of speed produces a dynamic effect that increases the stress. And typically, we account for this with a dynamic impact factor in the design code. And that design, dynamic impact factor is about 33%. And so this is a larger impact factor than what you would see in the code. And the other thing is, you can't really see it too much, but you can kind of see this ringing down here. The bridge actually rings down because you're, you're, it's like pinging the bridge with the load and then it vibrates down. Now, we also measured crack motion, right? And so uh, this is, again, I think that's the same location, location six. And this is both driving the truck across north and south, but slowly. So we're creeping this truck along. And you can see that when it's in the northbound lane, uh, the crack closes, reverses, and then opens. So these cracks are wide. In this case, when it's heading northbound, the crack closes. It gets over the continuous support, and then the crack opens again. So we're seeing the effect of the indeterminacy of the problem um, uh, affect what's going on locally with the cracks. And then if I drive the truck in the southbound lane, again slowly, what happens is the crack opens when it's actually on the other uh, side of the bent location and then closes as the truck comes across. So you're seeing the northbound and southbound lanes affecting the northbound uh, girder. Now why does crack motion matter? Well most of the time we consider cracks to be static, meaning concrete we expect it to crack. That's why we put the reinforcing steel in. In fact the steel doesn't really do much until the concrete cracks. Well, we expect that it cracks, but then it doesn't keep moving, right? Well, we're seeing these cracks moving. Now, if you look at the numbers here, it's not that big, right? This is, what, tens, hundreds, thousands, right? So two thousandths of an inch. That's not too big. But if you're going to epoxy inject cracks, for example, and, the crack, and you don't close the bridge to traffic, there's a chance that when you pump the epoxy in, traffic going over the bridge can pump the epoxy back out, right? Or if the epoxy is going from a liquid state to a solid state and it's being worked along that time, right, there's a potential you could uh, fail the epoxy in tension just because these cracks are not frozen right, as the epoxy goes through its transition state. All right, so we've done some uh, basic statics here. Um, look, this is just looking at the two-span continuous portion. And what's the effect of this uh, controlled load tr truck? And you can see that the red line is our dead load effect, and you can see that because of the statics of the problem, we have higher, this shear now, higher shear at the continuous support location from the statics. And here's the green line is the shear that's be being produced by our nice uh, fancy design truck here, or uh, maintenance truck that's driving over the bridge. And so what we tried to do with the statics is back out what kind of stresses, combined dead load and live load stresses, are we seeing in these stirrups. So I, I'm not going to bother you with all the details here, but uh, essentially, we counted the number of rebars that are crossing the crack using the proportion of the live load stress that's being carried on these instrumented stirrups. Project what's the contribution of these stirrups to the dead load, their effect carrying the dead load. And, and then calculated the superimposed live load on top of that. And if you follow the logic, you end up down here looking at combined live load and dead load stresses of about 26.4 KSI. 
All right, well, this is grade 40 steel. In fact, it's not really grade 40 steel. It's what they called in the old days intermediate grade steel, which is equivalent to what we would call grade 40 steel today. And the allowable stress would be about 20 KSI. And so you can see that the allowable is already over, um, and not by a, a, that small of an amount. And this is, again, this is the service level, right? We're seeing this, this is the, the maintenance truck that's driving over that's producing this level of stress. Okay, well, we've also done some uh, more sophisticated three-dimensional finite element analysis, um, looking at a full um, model of both the single span and the two-span continuous uh, bridge, doing some elastic analysis, looking at load distribution, trying to correlate the effect of that uh, maintenance truck and our field results with our analytical models. And then look at some parametric studies, meaning if we change the deck thickness, how do we change the load distribution? If we change the number of diaphragms, the number of, um, uh, I guess they're sub-beams that act as some type of <coughs> bracing to the main beams, and they're usually about quarter points. So if we change the dimensions of those diaphragms, if we make them larger or stiffer, or if we have additional uh, diaphragms, um, can we change the distribution of shear uh, in the bridge? And then also look at things like the creep effect. Over time, the dead load produces what we call creep, and so the modulus of elasticity reduces because of that in, in high compression uh, regions of the beam, as well as shrinkage and potentially some support settlement that may be contributing to uh, these shear uh, cracks. All right, so here's uh, uh, kind of a, a bird's eye view of this model. It's uh, 13,000 elements, roughly 80,000 degrees of freedom. Uh, this portion here, you can kind of see that there's a little line here. That's the break between the simply supported beam. And again, here's our two-span continuous portion. And it shows up not at all on the web, but uh, there, we're actually meddling, modeling the bent uh, columns. And the bent columns are fairly uh, spindly. And here's a view from underneath. And you can see that we're, we've got those diaphragms uh, running transverse to the uh, roadway direction. And here's a typical kind of stress output. The uh, back tandem of the uh, maintenance vehicle is located right here. And you can see that we're producing some uh, fairly significant shear stresses. And so if we look at the finite element results with our uh, field results, so our field data uh, shows we're normalizing strain because finite element results um, give us stress output. And what we have uh, in the field is actually strain at a stirrup. And so the finite element model is a continuum. The field results are discrete strains at a point. And so we have to normalize them. So we take the peak strain that we measured in the field, we compare it with the street peak stress that we uh, measure in our finite element result. And in the finite element model, we actually march the truck across. So we position it at, loca at specific locations along the model to produce kind of an influence uh, response. And you can see that our field data, shown with the green line with the little black boxes here, um, does a pretty good job of matching up with our field results. Uh, almost remarkably good job. Um, frighteningly good uh, as far as correlating experiments, uh, especially in the field, with uh, some analytical results. And so what this says is, even though this is a cracked problem, and it, you would expect it to be somewhat nonlinear, that elastic analysis using finite elements uh, does a pretty good job of at least predicting load distribution and what kind of stress ranges you might be seeing um, even at local uh, locations. So that's an important finding. So we don't really have to go, uh, at least for this uh, part of the analysis, we don't have to go to complex, uh, computationally intensive, nonlinear um, uh, finite element modeling. All right, so the next step, what we're doing is some laboratory testing. And this is some smaller uh, scale work that we've done uh, previously. These beams are only about two feet deep. Uh, and the beams we're talking about now are, are significantly larger. We're looking at this problem of 1950s vintage, reinforced, conventionally reinforced concrete uh, bridges. And we've got shear cracking in positive moment regions, and we've got shear cracking in negative moment regions, right, over continuous supports. And so we've got to consider the shear effect combined with moment at both of those locations. So even though these both look like T-sections, if you look closely, this one we have all the reinforcing steel up near the top. So this would be considered our negative moment region. So this is where the uh, girder is continuous over a bent location. And if you look over here on the right-hand side, 
Uh, you can see the main uh, flexural steel is down here in the bottom. So this would be a positive moment region uh, close to a simple support or uh, a roller support at the end of the bridge or end of a girder. Um, what we've done is we've gotten steel uh, for the stirrups that's fairly close to this intermediate grade steel they would have used in, used in the 1950s. So we're using grade 40, number 4 bars for the stirrups. Um, and these were uh, produced uh, um, in, out of McMinnville um, by Cascade Steel uh, Rolling Mills. Uh, the amount of steel that we're using in the flexural, uh, for flexural steel, we've actually gone and we've created a database of these cracked bridges, and we've tried to figure out what is the reinforcement ratio, uh, because if we add too much reinforcing steel, we can change how these beams can behave in shear, because the dowel action, the contribution of the flexural steel itself to the shear capacity, uh, can change the result. So we've tried to reflect realistic re uh, reinforcement ratios for flexural steel. Um, the other thing is that these, uh, the stirrup spacing that we're uh, including range from about 6 inches, which is our tightest spacing, uh, all the way out to 18 inches, which is um, roughly a D over 2, so a very wide stirrup spacing. And that covers really the range of stirrup spacings that we're seeing in practice. Now, the overall size that we've come up with is 48 inches, so a 4-foot deep girder with a 6-inch uh, slab contribution, and that's pretty typical uh, this is like, if you looked at all this data for what are the girder proportions for these uh, 500 cracked bridges, but this is right at the heart of the problem as far as the size of the girder goes, the depth and the width, the reinforcing steel ratio, and that deck contribution. So you can think of this as, this is the kind of the, if you had to tip, take a typical uh, bridge girder section for all of these uh, bridges that exist in the family of population out there, what would it look like? And this is kind of what it would look like. Uh, here's the reinforcing cage going in. This is for the positive moment region because you can see the steel is all located down here uh, in what would be the flexural tension region. We've got some additional um, anchorage here. The bottom layer of steel is hooked, um, and we've got some uh, hairpins here to confine our bearing location. Uh, this is the top, so we've cast the stem now. We're doing a two-part process to model what they would have done in the 1950s in the field construction. Normally, they would cast the stems, uh, and it would take some period of time for that to cure, for them to add the, the uh, slab steel, and about seven days later, they would go back and cast the slab. And the, then how do you get this stem to be integral with the slab? And so what they did is they'd have these little sheer teeth um, at the interface between the deck and the stem. And so uh, we're producing this in a similar to way to what they would have done in the 50s using stamping. So you let the concrete kind of harden up a little bit and you stamp these and you can see that there's about four, four or five stamps and that gives you enough time so that the concrete doesn't flow back into those uh, shear keys. So that's how we're getting composite action between the deck and the stem in addition to the, the legs of the stirrups uh, themselves. So trying to replicate that field uh, construction as well as the overall dimensions of these girders. Uh, I'll give you an idea of scale. Uh, this is one of our graduate students, uh, B.J. Farrell, who uh, um, to, to, he, he's not the tallest guy, he's not the shortest guy, he's kind of your average guy. So you can see that these are about, uh, these are fairly large bridge girders, overall length about 24 uh, feet long. Now we're doing a little bit of a different loading history than what most people have done in the past when they've tested concrete beams. Most of the time they do, if they're doing um, gravity type loading, they do a monotonic type of loading, which means they just keep increasing the load to higher and higher levels until it finally fails. And that's kind of represented here by this red line. Uh, just keep loading it up higher and higher. Well, that's not really reflective of what's going on in these bridges, right? We've got trucks coming on producing load, we've got trucks, and they hopefully they get off the bridge and the load goes away, right? And so we're trying to, to simulate what happens as you load up, load down. Uh, because we want to see what's the effect of the shear carrying mechanism. If I keep increasing the shear, I also increase the moment. And so in the compression zone, if I keep going to higher and higher levels, the compression stress gets higher and higher. Well, if I can compress the, uh, 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 stress the concrete higher in compression, I can transmit additional shear through that. And so if I crack the girder and I have to unload, I've got to pass back through that damage state to get to the same level of moment. And so there's a potential that the beam could actually fail at a lower state because of that shear damage. So that's why we're loading and unloading to keep getting up to a higher level. Uh, 
And so uh, we'll see, uh, we've just started doing this large scale testing, what kind of difference that produces. The other thing we're doing is diff looking at the effect of continuing fatigue loading and how that changes uh, the growth of these cracks and the shear carrying capacity of these sections. And so for different um, threshold levels, you can see that we load it up and the average stress is about here. The dead load stress would kind of be this white line. And we're looking at different, what's the effect of the stress range on these, uh, the shear crack growth and the effect on its capacity. Uh, here's an overall picture of our 18-inch uh, stirrup spacing in our load frame. Uh, the capacity of our, the load frame is about 600 kips or so. Well, it's about, actually closer to about 700 kips. Uh, we're limited by our actuator size, actually. And you can see we're doing what appears to be three-point bending. But if you look a little closer, well, you really can't see it from this photo, but we actually have about a two-foot distance between a roller support here and a roller support here. And so what it really produces is a very small four-point bend test. And the reason we do that is we don't want the shear cracking on the right-hand side, here we go, and left-hand side to interact with one another. And so that's why we have this little bit of a constant moment region. And so this is what the girder looks like at failure. And you can see that we've got, this is the failure crack, and you can see the compression zone actually blows out right here. And we've got some other fairly large uh, cracks that don't um, cause failure of this girder. Uh, we're also producing uh, that same kind of deck peeling crack that I talked about from the very early part of the field test, where you're seeing that shear crack coming up at a diagonal. It reaches the soffit of the deck, and it turns horizontal. And so this is actually, this is our experiment. This is the deck soffit. This is the web. And you can see here's the diagonal crack coming up, and it turns horizontal. And that's really just a closer up view, this picture here, of the crack as it comes up right in here. So in, in these laboratory tests, we're producing what, what are realistic looking um, uh, shear behavior. And this is the size of the crack at about 320 kips, 325 kips. And that is not a marker. All right, the marker draw is actually here. This is the actual crack width. And this is our crack gauge that we normally use to measure the crack size. And you can see that it's off the scale. Uh, it's about a failure, a little less than a quarter of an inch. So a very wide shear crack. And this happens to be very widely spaced stirrups. My graduate students didn't want to get under there when I had 325 <laughs> kips, so that's my hand. All right, so we're also doing um, a fairly unique test, which is um, kind of trying to take out a, a sub-piece of this bridge structure and look at the effect of, of the moving load on shear. If you looked at that previous test, we always put the load at mid-span. In fact, everybody has always had a static load, and they just keep keep that load at the same point. We, we might get larger and larger loads. We might load and unload. But the load point never moves. And so the interaction between shear and moment is always the same. So by golly, we know where it's going to fail. We know where we put the load. It's got to fail there, right? Well, if we have a moving load, the bridge doesn't necessarily have a propensity to fail at any one particular location because we've got this interaction between shear and moment. And so in the field, if we look back at the shear cracks that we saw in the field, they're widely distributed, right, widely spaced. And they're not interacting with one another like we see in, in all laboratory experiments. So what we're doing is we're going to try to cut out, not a real bridge, but we're going to build a girder that's like this continuous support location. And you can think of this location right here as a point of inflection for dead load. And this location is a point of inflection for dead load. And we can take this, here's my bent location down here. And I can superimpose the static dead load contribution by cranking down at the two ends. So this is like putting a stick over your knee and pulling down on it. And then put on a moving load that's a, a hydraulic cylinder on a carriage that can roll. Right? And so we can start by taking this load and at very small levels and change the magnitude as a function of position so that we can faithfully reproduce at different sections. So you can think that as the trucks are moving across, they're producing shears and moments that are like a spirograph almost of how the shear and moment changes as the position of that truck changes. So with this moving load that we have, we can actually change the magnitude of the load as it moves along the span. So it doesn't have to be a constant load. We can actually vary it for small here and make it large as we come in. And so we can have this element be subjected to what are realistic 
moment shear envelopes that it would see in the field and see if that doesn't change the behavior and produce those more field realistic cracking conditions. And nobody has ever done that before. And so we'll see how, uh, how much time and effort it actually takes to, to put this setup together. But we're talking about a moving load up in the neighborhood of you know quarter of a million pounds. So it's not a small amount of force to be dragging around uh, with some kind of a winch. Okay, well, um, some conclusions. Uh, first of all, uh, we, when we looked at those uh, field locations chipped in to expose the reinforcing steel, we didn't see any big corrosion issues. So we didn't see that the, that the rebar was experience, experiencing uh, any visible significant corrosion. And so what that tells us, either the conditions aren't right at these crack locations to produce corrosion, or it's a fairly new problem, right? They're new cracks. And we also didn't notice any fractured stirrups. So they're not uh, at these wide crack locations. The stirrups are still intact, and they're carrying load. And that's a good thing. We saw more damage on the exterior girders than the interior girders. We were seeing these cracks open and close under uh, repeated loading. Um, and we saw, uh, and so that has some implications for repair techniques. That's an important finding. Uh, we saw some dynamic impact factors, about 46%, sig more significant than what you would expect for the code. In general, we saw fairly small stress ranges, um, although we're doing uh, some other bridges to make sure that that trend uh, continues. And we're seeing combined live load and dead load stresses that are uh, above what one would uh, like to see. And I'll give you a, uh, kind of a brief movie, and I'll run it a couple times here, of what a sheer... Shear failure looks like. Uh, they're notoriously non ductile, and so you can see that you do get uh, that's what the shear cracks tell you, right? That you've got uh, you're getting pretty lar large loads coming on. Um, but when it lets loose, it lets loose. So it's a fairly non-ductile failure mode. And as engineers, structural engineers, we try to uh, preclude non-ductile failure modes and have nice ductile failure modes like flexural failures. And so that's one of the concerns that uh, we have with this problem. Because it's non-ductile, uh, we're doing this a kind of extensive research uh, program to really understand what the, the problem is that we're, that we're seeing in the field. Now with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes? Very general question. How long have these measurement technologies been available to you? Like the lasers and, and um, the vibrations and whatnot. Do I, should I repeat the question? So they have uh, oh, great, great. Um, the measurement technologies, the, the laser measurement um, is something that uh, contractors have used probably for, I imagine they've been in their hands for uh, five years or so. Um, most folks who go out nowadays for like eight heating and ventilating contractors do all their measurements with lasers rather than with tape measure. Um, so that technology is uh, not particularly new. Um, we're using it just because it's so much faster. Uh, and that's the reason they're using it as well. Uh, the measurement as far as the strain gauges and the displacement sensors, uh, strain gauges have been around for a long, long time. Um, the difference nowadays um, is that we have very f efficient um, computer-based data acquisition systems that we can suck in huge amounts of data um, at very high frequency rates so we can look at the dynamic effects that most people um, in the olden days, 1950s, 60s even, didn't have. But that technology has been around for a while. The, the newest technology that we're using is kind of the, the stress-triggered video um, and we're actually using the web to be able to communicate with our data system. It's all cellular, so we can call it up and download the data. We can actually download the images. We could monitor. We could actually, uh, via the web, turn the camera around and make sure that our data acquisition system is intact and nobody has cut wires and things like that. So that's probably the, the most new technology that we're using. Yes? I apologize if, if you already covered this, but when you fill in the cracks, you have an estimated time of how long that'll last, or is it as good as new? Or will you have to continually go back and refill those cracks? Um, with the epoxy injection, uh, one of the issues with, the, with all these repairs, particularly the FRP repairs, um, and which if, if you bond on this fiber-reinforced polymer external, these, these carbon fiber stirrups, you're required to uh, epoxy inject the cracks before you can bond on uh, that FRP material. 
And there's a question of what is the life of one of these repairs. Um, just plain epoxy injection or epoxy injection with the uh, fiber-reinforced polymers. Um, and no one really knows the question to that because the ap that material and the applications are so new, we just don't have a, a broad uh, base of experience, um, field experience, to say how long it's going to last. And so right now it's conservative. Uh, they're estimating about 10 years uh, uh, how much time you can buy using that kind of an approach. But really, the, there's no known answer for what is the exact life of something like that. Sure. So if 10 years is the lifespan, would you then give it the same treatment for another 10 years, or do you have to just replace it completely at a certain That's a good question. Um, depends. I think it would depend on what uh, is the m continuing mechanism of degradation. If, for example, let's say I epoxy inject cracks and the epoxy injection does a really good job of preventing those cracks, the existing cracks, from opening and closing anymore. But I continue to allow large loads traveling over this, this bridge, and it produces new cracks somewhere else, right? Um, you might be able to go back and epoxy inject the new cracks, or it might actually open up these epoxy injected cracks previously. And it will depend, I think, on... Uh, so there's no real answer to that question either, but it will depend on what is the mechanism of continued... Um, degeneration, if you will. Um, and I, I don't know if how many times you can actually go back in um, and epoxy inject uh, before sooner or later. You know, if the crack keeps getting wider and wider and I keep filling it with epoxy material, I mean, well, sooner or later you're going to have a band of epoxy like this and the bridge would have grown, you know, several feet if I'm adding that every at every location. So, um, I'm not sure how, how much time and, and whether you can actually go back in and, and do it again. Yes? Um, <clears throat> what, is, what is the relationship between the... You, you, you're talking mostly about the stress on the bridges from traffic, especially trucks and cars, but also I was wondering what the relationship is between that and stresses caused by, say, the rare earthquakes or more common, the heat and the colds, especially on I-5, um, where you do have a certain temperature variation between summer and winter, as well as the pollution from traffic going through there. I assume the pollution would affect the concrete a little bit. Okay, a lot, a lot of issues there. Um, seismic. Um, this, is, this is not looking at this from a seismic perspective. Um, the actual details of these bridges, um, the bents in particular, um, would contain what we would define as non-ductile um, details. Short lap lengths, probably uh, insufficient number of ties to sustain large numbers of inelastic, cyclic uh, cycles. So we're not really addressing seismic issues related to this problem. This is keeping these things carrying live load. Um, and the difference is in return period, right? Large seismic event, very long return period versus live load that's a very short return period, right? That's every day, every minute, every second, right, going over this, uh, the bridge. So from a seismic perspective, um, I mean, we have a whole number of issues in the, in the state related to that, not just for this problem and not just for bridges. I mean, there's uh, uh, structures issues, uh, a number of different structures issues. Um, as far as uh, temperature cycling, you're certainly going to see thermal uh, strains that are produced um, because of seasonal changes. Um, and uh, from so hot to cold, uh, you know, the bridge is going to expand and contract. That is going to contribute uh, to crack motion um, in a very long time span because concrete bridges have a large thermal mass. So they, they're not like steel bridges that cool uh, relatively quickly because they're uh, much thinner and they can conduct uh, uh, heat uh, uh, much faster than concrete because it's just so massive. Um, but over seasonal change, uh, you'll get shrinkage from, w uh, let's say, winter to summer because of uh, the moisture conditions, and you'll see uh, uh, changes because of temperature. Um, so you will see, I think, some seasonal variation in crack width. Um, the concern is that uh, in the window of time, right, you may see, if you track these cracks over time, you should see some type of seasonal effect, long time uh, changing. 
the thing is you don't want to see short time changing. So if I go back in a month and I see the crack uh, changing very significantly, that's a, a, a point of concern rather than a, a seasonal variation. But you will see, I think, some, some seasonal change. Uh, pollution, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, most of these bridges, I would say, are no worse affected than uh, any uh, any concrete structure in any major city, for example. And I'm I'm not aware that your ambient pollution um, has any significant deteriorating effects, uh, even though they've been around since the 1950s. We've got a lot of clean air in Oregon, and it's. Uh, uh, if you look at the, the bridges and their locations, it's not clear. I-5, you, you might say, well, there could be a potential uh, pollution problem there because there are so many on I-5. But at the same time, I-5 gets uh, you know, a lot of traffic on a, on a daily basis. And we've got uh, problems out in l beautiful eastern Oregon with uh, nice clean air, uh, nice dry desert air. So um, it's not clear that there's an, a, per a particularly environmental problem uh, that's, that's contributing to the problem. Yes. Looking at other ways of retrofitting these buildings is it, or bridges, is it really cost effective to do so? Or are we looking at just having to rebuild these bridges within a pretty short time frame? Um, there are two issues. One is uh, you need to maintain some type of transportation freight corridor for this state. So if you look at uh, the distribution of these bridges, I-5, I-84, and secondary highways, U.S. highways and Oregon highways, um, it, clearly, you want to keep I-5 open. Uh, in fact, I, I think states are obligated to other states to keep the, the in, interstate transportation system working. Um, the problem it lies in the numbers of bridges that we're dealing with and the cost of trying to uh, handle all of those bridges at one time. And uh, so you have two issues. One is you want to make sure you've got major transportation corridors uh, uh, open and available for commerce as well as uh, in the event of an emergency, right, that you need to uh, have ac uh, evacuation uh, issues. So um, the, the, you still need all these secondary roads that are going to need treatment at some point as well. So uh, it's going to probably some, be some uh, type, and, and this is more ODOT's question, and it's probably a political question as much as anything else, um, within the legislature about which ones are going to get uh, priority and, uh, and how the, the problem is going to be uh, approached. It might be some combination replacement and, and repair so that you can buy some time uh, so you can find funds to, to remediate the problem. Yes? Uh, just, um, just, just a general question. The problem in Oregon, is it um, common all over the United States, in California and Washington? Or is it only in Oregon? Because you mentioned this reinforced concrete deck gridder bridges. Is it just Oregon that built that bridges during that period, or is it all over the states? Um, it was actually uh, used in other states, not just on the West Coast, but the East Coast. Um, the difference is it seemed to be a favorite uh, for Oregon, um, and there hasn't been a large replacing of bridges over time. California, because of the seismic rehabilitation that they've done, has replaced a large number of their older bridges. So if you do a database search of California bridges of this type, there are uh, very few numbers of bridges compared to Oregon of this kind of vintage and construction type. If you look at Washington, similarly, uh, you're going to find uh, they have an order of magnitude, num fewer numbers of bridges that, of this kind of type that, than we do. Uh, so it's not that they don't exist in other states. The issue is that they do exist, but in smaller numbers. Um, I, I believe ODOT has queried some other states about do they have the same kind of problem? Do they have these kinds of bridges? People say they do have these kinds of bridges, but they don't see this kind of problem. And uh, we're not clear why that is the case necessarily. Yes? Okay, two questions. Um, are there federal, any federal monies and kind of federal pots of money that are marked fairly specifically for these? that can be dedicated to this kind of work. And, um, and also, if you're finding, if some of your findings are indicating that maybe the moving loads or whatever should be brought down on some of these bridges, can that then, are you looking to pass those on as policy recommendations to put limits on loads? Ah, uh, I'm an engineer, not a politician. <laughs> um, Policy decisions as far as what loads uh, are allowed to drive over, what bridges uh, are made um, based on a whole host of differing um, viewpoints. 
Um, it's, well, I can say this. It is clear that the loads are producing damage, right? Uh, if I don't have the loads, I don't have the damage. Um, but is, the, is it a reasonable expectation that these bridges should not show damage for the loads that we're considering driving over in Oregon? That's a, a question that's open to debate. If you do look at the loads from Washington, California, and Oregon, we're a little more um, free uh, about what will allow compared to what uh, other states will allow. Um, but policy decisions are outside of my uh, area of expertise. And we're not actually looking specifically to say, okay, the truckloads are too big and, and that's what's causing the damage. It's more, we've got the damage. Uh, and and um, we're not seeing the damage with newer bridge construction, right? So we're, we're not sure that the, the loads um, are too high necessarily. But w what we say is the damage exists. We have to understand the damage and how it's going to propagate, how it's going to potentially get worse, and how much reserve capacity do we have given the damage that exists. So it's not so much that we're trying to say the loads are too big or the loads are too small. It's the, here's what the loads are. I, I've got the load tables that are permitted in Oregon, and I've got to understand what kind of forces are produced on these structures and how long, uh, w what kind of life I can kind of expect out of that. And that's the, really the focus of the research. Yes? Do you have any way to determine, um, like, if, if they restrict the bridges to the heavy loads and you may need four, four trucks to carry what used to be carried in three heavier loads going across the same bridge, and would that have any implications because you're on the bridge life with the different loads? It, well, there, there's a couple issues there. One is um, depending on, on how you characterize fatigue damage, right? There are two ways. One is numbers of cycles, and the other is stress range. Right? So th those two things and how they interact with one another. So your one alternative is you can have more cycles but at smaller stress range or fewer cycles at larger stress range. Well, it depends on where you are in, in the fatigue life kind of curve. If the stress range is below the infinite life stress range, I can have a large number of cycles and I don't really can't care how many actually go over. But if I've got uh, uh, cycles that are above that threshold, then I've got to worry about counting those cycles. So it depends where you are uh, uh, on the fatigue life curve, if you will. Do you know for the like 80,000, which is the legal load for trucks, where that falls? I, I would assume it's a, above. Um, 80,000 pound gross vehicle weight is not clear what are the shears and moments that are produced on a given bridge. You can think, if I just look at the table values, for example, um, it will say, let's say, 110,000 pound gross vehicle weight. But the actual configuration of where those axles are can produce very different shears and moments in a simple span compared to a three-span continuous and depending on what the span lengths are, right? So let's say I have a three-span continuous uh, deck girder bridge, 50-foot spans, and I've got a standard tractor trailer. That's, that's 80,000 pounds, right? It's going to produce a certain shear and moment at different sections, let's say, that I'll classify as A. But I can take an 80,000 pound truck that, that still meets the, the table requirements on that same bridge, and if I change, if I make that much more compact, a shorter truck, I can produce a very different shear and moment distribution on that same bridge. And so just saying gross vehicle weight or uh, is not necessarily the, the right way to classify uh, or characterize what's going to be produced, the load effect that's produced at the structural level. And one of the things we're doing is looking at what are the actual shears and moments that are produced on a typical bridge given the table values. Yes? Um, I have I could, two questions. Um, you showed the video of uh, two trucks passing over one in, e in each of the two lanes and <clears throat> say that the combined issue. Um, is there possibly a policy thing of, of requiring on these lanes like signage saying trucks use right lane only on this bridge in order to uh, limit that happening where you have two trucks passing at the same time? Is that, is that a po potential policy solution in the short term to reduce uh, and then the second one is we, we talked in a, this course about uh, congestion pricing or, or travel pricing. And is there, uh, would that be a possible solution for funding of the re 
you know, replacement of these bridges is start charging trucks as they go over these bridges. If they're going to use them, then pay for them and then accumulate money to build new ones. Um, like an easy pass system for trucks, right? So this bridge, uh, it cost you 25 cents, this bridge. Um, well, I'll go to the first question. Um, no, I don't recall what the first question is. What the uh, keep requiring well, trucks and uh, okay, I'm not passing single file. Right, right, right. Single file. It's an enforcement issue, right? Right now, we require bridges to divert around or trucks to divert around certain bridges. Um, we we somewhat rely on them to do that. Um, and if you count the numbers of trucks that are doing it, then you can say, yes, they're self-enforcing. But there's not a, a flagger out there saying, you have to pull off, you have to pull off, right? Um, and if you just look at a truck, it's not clear what the loads are that it's carrying. So um, it's, it would have to be self-policing, and you'd have to have, I mean, in the numbers of bridges we're talking about, you would essentially force trucks to be in the right-hand lane at all times, no passing. And if you've ever driven in Oregon behind one of those Winnebago's or something, you know that uh, we'd have a lot of road rage on I-5 um, if that were the case. Um, the other one, easy pass kind of system for pay as you go. I think uh, most truckers would argue that they pay significant taxes already, um, and as part of that is they would assume that, that that's being used to fund uh, the interstate and the state highway system. So that's a political issue as well, and, and how that would get resolved. Right now, I think uh, the push is toward licensing uh, fee increases to pay for some of this. Um, I'm not sure. Licensing fee, uh, just you could drive Wait. a whole, whole bunch. Well, I mean, like you and I and everybody else who gets a, uh, wants to be, have their vehicle right. plated in Oregon. Well, I guess the, uh, the thing with the licensing fee is you could, you could drive over that bridge a thousand times and pay the same rate. Where the congestion pricing is, is if you, if if you uh, have business, you know, in, on both sides of that bridge, and you need to have your trucks going there often with heavy loads, you would pay for it. And uh, I guess you remember the political argument might be is that well, we can reroute you, and you can pay more uh, in time, and uh, or we can charge you for this bridge and raise the money to fix it, and then uh, you can uh, save money. You know, so that might be the. Yeah, it's it's all it's very political. Um, it it comes down to uh, the particular bridge, the particular economic impact. I mean, one bridge in a remote eastern part of Oregon, for example, may have a tremendous value to that community. Um, let's say there's a quarry or a pit associated with that, and it provides you know 60 percent of employment for that little town. That bridge has a huge economic impact, not just for the company that uses that bridge but for everything associated with that company. So it's not, um, it's not, I'm not sure a pay-as-you-go for use is, is the answer necessarily as well. I, and these are all, I'm not, this is not my area um, and there are many more people that are, are looking at those kinds of uh, policy and funding issues. But the need is to raise money because the cost is coming. Is that uh, it, it, if you want them fixed, it's going to cost money. Yes. Do you know if any of the railroad bridges are also having this, these problems? Uh, railroad bridges may not necessarily be of the same type and generation of construction. Um, I haven't looked specifically at, at railroad bridges, and I, I couldn't answer whether uh, they even exist in this kind of form. Yes. Um, you mentioned that other states that have this have used this type of technology don't seem to have the same potential failure rate that's happening in Oregon. So, is that because of the construction quality that happened during this process in the '50s, or what other external factors might be the reason for it? Um, I'm not sure. I would. Uh, say, construction quality or construction practice. I mean, the, the, they were using state-of-the-practice techniques and technology for the time. Um, and I don't think one could say that they were worse or better than what we would do today. Um, so I, I wouldn't say the construction is, the, is necessarily the issue. Uh, 
or inspection or design, you know, I, I, I mean, the tools they were using were state of the practice for the time. Um, and as, obviously, we continue to generate service performance um, and continue to generate new experimental results and new analytical results, we improve our design specifications and our practice so that we can do better in the future. Um, and this is, I think, just one of those things where uh, we're going to learn from, from what, what, what's been done from the past. Not because I've done anything wrong, but just... So if, if it's not for uh, construction, then what other possibility is it that this is an anomaly to Oregon, not throughout the rest of the U.S.? Um, numbers, first of all. The numbers of these kinds of bridges are high in this state. Pre-stressed didn't make uh, as uh, fast an introduction to Oregon as it did in some of the other states. Um, so we, we stuck with this form of construction in larger numbers and longer than most other states. So we just have a larger number of, of these kinds of bridges. If you look at other states, they just don't have the same population of bridges. And that's not to say they're not cracked. Um, it's just to say that they maybe, not, uh, maybe aren't paying as much attention to them because they're such a small part of their problem um, and they're such a large part of our problem. Yes? What does it generally cost to do these types of repairs that you've been talking about? Uh, it depends on the repair. It depends on the access. Um, if you've got to build uh, shoring, for example, if you've got to be over water, uh, or if so there's a lot of different issues that go into cost. It depends on the repair technique um, that, that people choose. Um, so I can't really answer specific dollar values, but, you know, it could be uh, several hundred thousand dollars for uh, uh, FRP kind of repair. Is, um, do you have a sense of how ODOT is going to generalize this? I mean, do they have detailed inspection records of every bridge, or are they sort of still in a reactive mode more than a proactive mode? Um, I, I think ODOT has done a pretty good job of managing the problem, from, and that's my opinion. Um, they have um, isolated all of these bridges, and they've looked at them, and they have uh, inspection mapping for this particular shear crack problem um, for the bridges, and they've gone and looked and categorized uh, this family of bridges for the, the damage that, that exists, and they've ranked them uh, as far as the level of damage and tried to, I think, come up with some kind of prioritization. They've also gotten a commission, an independent commission, to kind of take a step back and look at the, this problem and give them recommendations. Um, and that was, they produced a report, um, yeah, I think, at the beginning of this year uh, as far as is it a, a problem and, and kind of recommendations for what, what should be done. And I think the, one of the primary recommendations is to look at making sure that there are freight corridors, I-5 and I-84 in particular, that we don't have to worry about um, having to route trucks on and off of that. I mean, it's a hassle to get off of I-5 and drive through downtown Eugene. And if you're a person who lives in Eugene, you're probably not particularly happy about that either. Um, even though most of the failure was seismic, um, was there anything to be gained, any knowledge learned uh, as far as how well the repairs these types of repairs work with a lot of the work that's going on down in the Bay Area? Uh, seismic is a different issue um, because we're doing stress reversals and not small stress, but large cyclic stress reversals. And that's uh, going to have a much different effect on the behavior of a repair than a, a loading unloading without the stress reversal. Um, I mean, you can get I mean, obviously, you look at the, the research that's been done, but uh, I'm not sure you can make a correspondence between cyclic performance and fatigue, high cycle fatigue performance. Before we thank our speaker, I want to thank the audience and uh, also mention that uh, our first seminar next term will be Friday, April 4th. Uh, Metro Council President David Bragdon will be the speaker. And so I hope to see you all then. And thank you very much, Professor Higgins. Thank you.